Hello everyone, I'm Ernie Humphrey, the CEO of Treasury Webinars. I'm thrilled to be hosting a compelling webinar in the Topalti Payables Nation webinar series, Hot Topics for Global Tax Requirements in Accounts Payable. I would like to thank everyone for taking the time to join us for our webinar today. The end of the year is coming. Today you'll hear from experts at KPMG on creating compliant processes for handling tax requirements when dealing with domestic and international suppliers as you close out 2019 and head into 2020. Today, we're honored to have Lori Hatton Boyd, principal at KPMG, with us to explain how tax requirements impact organizations with global supplier bases and the legal and financial penalties for non-compliance. Today, you'll learn how to master IRS tax rules as they relate to global, paying global suppliers, Steps for avoiding legal and financial penalties, conquering complex WA and 1042S situations, and improper withholding. Before I delve into the content, I'm going to offer a few quick housekeeping items, and then I'm going to welcome our esteemed speakers to the webinar today. A few housekeeping items. Uh, we can take your questions at any time in the questions area of our GoToWebinar control panel. We'll do our best to get to your questions at the tail end of the webinar today during our Q&A session, time permitting. Fear not, if we don't get to your question during the webinar today, we will follow up with you directly. If you have any technical issues, please use the chat, chat window in order to communicate with us. If you're interested in receiving CPE credits for today's webinar today, you'll have to be on the line for the entire webinar and complete all of our polling questions today. Now it is my distinct pleasure to welcome our featured speakers to the webinar. We first we have Anand Misra, product man marketing at Tapalti. Anand is the director of product marketing at Tapalti, where he drives product positioning, sales, messaging, competitive analysis, and product differentiation, among other things. Before Tapalti, he was the director of product marketing at NetSuite, where he spent six years driving messaging and positioning for their ERP seat. With over 15 years' experience in product marketing and product management, he has helped launch many new products over the years. Prior to NetSuite, he was a senior product marketing manager at ADP. His work experience also includes roles at Thomson Reuters and Walter Clures. He holds a BS in biology, MS in communication, and an MBA in banking and finance. Lori Hatton Board is a principal in KPMG's information reporting and withholding tax services practice. In this role, she advises financial institutions and other withholding agents on their tax withholding and information reporting requirements for payments made to U.S. and non-U.S. account holders and counterparties. As a partner in KPMG's IRW practice, Lori routinely engages a wide range of withholding tax advisory services to assist both financial and financial non-financial institutions in complying with their tax information reporting and withholding requirements. She is a frequent speaker on foreign withholding taxes and has authored articles appearing in the Tax Lawyer and the International Tax Review. She holds a JD degree from Gonzaga University and an LLM from Georgetown University Law Center. Lori, it's our pleasure to have you. Welcome to the webinar. The floor is yours. Take it away. Thanks, Ernie. So we're going to just start talking about the, the payments that you're making, and we're really going to focus on accounts payable as we go through this. Um, first, I'll just run through the agenda. Um, first, we're going to talk about the compliance issues as it relates to 1441 withholding, which is the withholding of the substantive tax um, that's required on payments made to non-U.S. persons. Um, we're going to talk about focusing on tax documentation, W8s, W9s. Uh, we're going to go into some of the persistent problems we're seeing with those forms. Um, and then most importantly in this space, we're going to go over the 1042 audit uh, processes. The IRS is very focused on exams in the 1042 space right now. So we're going to talk about some of the best practices you could do so that you'll be prepared uh, if and when that happens. All right. Thank you so much. So before we let Lori really dive into her content, we're going to go ahead and launch our first polling question here today. We're asking you to share with you on when you collect tax forms of suppliers, during supplier onboarding, before payment is ever made. Do you try and collect during onboardings, but sometimes you don't get it until after the payment goes out? At year end, when you need to prepare 1099, 1042S reports, or you don't regularly collect tax forms? Please be honest, we're not gonna tell your boss on you if you don't regularly collect your tax forms. We appreciate everyone's consideration in answering all of our polling questions here today. Please note that those of you interested in receiving CPE credits for today's webinar, you'll have to answer all of our polling questions here today. Just a quick reminder, we can take your questions at any time in the questions area and your go-to webinar control panel. It's a tremendous opportunity as Lori is a world-renowned thought leader um, in this area and Anand has tremendous experience in this arena as well. So I encourage you to take advantage of this tremendous opportunity. 
We're going to go ahead and take a quick peek at the results, and then we're going to let Lori dive into IRC Section 1441, the Compliance Initiative. So let's go ahead and close that polling question. So let's go ahead and share those results um, really quickly. So let's take a quick peek. Lori, does anything jump out to you here? Is this about what you expected, better, worse? What are your thoughts here? Yeah, no, I, I think this is great. I mean, obviously you want to get those forms before the payments are made, and it looks like the vast majority of people are, are really doing that. So that, that's great news. Okay, I'm sure you're going to touch on this later, but in case not uh, so much right now. So if you would give us a brief overview, sort of the implications of not doing that before a payment goes out, and why is that a best practice? Yeah, so if, it, it's going to hinge, of course, on the types of payments you're making, but if you're making certain FDAP payments, fixed determinable annual periodical income, um, if you don't have the tax documentation prior to making the payment, the, in the regulations there's mandatory presumption rules, and we'll get over go over that in just a little bit, but, but in essence, those presumption rules are purposefully designed to, to ensure that the highest rate of withholding is, is going to be required. Um, and, and of course, as a withholding agent, if you don't impose the withholding that you're supposed to impose, then the liability becomes yours. So that's why it's so significant that you get those forms up front. Thank you so much. Let's go ahead and jump in to your next section. Yes, sure. So first, we're just going to talk about um, 1441 withholding in, in general. Um, so here we, we had those FDAP payments that I was talking about. So it's fixed, determinable, annual, or periodical income. Um, to, to the left hand here, we've got payments going to a U.S. person. Um, in that circumstance, uh, you're going to have um, a requirement to get a tax ID. In certain cases, it needs to be under penalties of perjury, which means it actually needs to be provided on a, in a W-9 form. Um, but for, for certain accounts payable, you just need to get the TIN in any manner provided. Um, if you don't get the TIN prior to making the payment, there is a 24% backup withholding that's required on those payments. And of course, the reporting for that would be on a form 1099, um, the 1099 MISC for uh, the, the vendor payments that we're going to focus on today. And then, of course, the IRS is matching that 1099 up with the vendor's tax return to make sure that they're properly uh, reporting the income and paying the tax. Um, on the right-hand side, we've got those same type of payments, but going to a non-U.S. person. So here we've got the statutory 30% rate of withholding on, on the FIDAP payments. There are certain um, reductions either under the code or, or an income tax treaty, and we'll get into what is necessary to be able to reduce those rates of withholding at source. Um, of course, on this side, we're only focused on U.S. source income versus the, the payments to the U.S. persons because as U.S. persons, we're taxed on a worldwide income. We would care about U.S. and non-U.S. source income. Um, and then the payments to the foreign persons, the information return associated with those is the Form 1042-S. Um, it's just the, the non-U.S. equivalent of the 1099, um, where treaty benefits have been claimed by the persons. Um, the, the United States shares that information with its treaty partners so that they can um, also make sure that those persons are reporting their income locally where required and paying the tax. So first, we, we talked about this 30% withholding, and we're going to focus right now on the payments to the non-U.S. persons. So again, there's a statutory rate of 30% withholding. It's gross basis taxation, so it's the, on the gross payment. Um, and then we'll talk about certain reductions that might be available. As a withholding agent, determining the character and source of the payment is your responsibility. And as you could imagine, there's, there's presumption rules that are going to uh, result in the worst case scenario if you're not able to reasonably determine what that character and source of the payments are. Um, the 30% can be reduced, as I said, and the documentation, the W-8 forms is the key, um, really the cornerstone to that regime. Um, where, and the only way you're gonna be able to reduce the rate of withholding is to have these valid forms, and we'll get into that in detail. Um, I talked about the Form 1042-S is the information uh, return associated with these payments. The tax return is the 1042. This is where you're gonna report the uh, gross income that you paid and the withholding that was imposed. All of these forms are due on March 15th of the calendar year following the year of payment. Um, there are extensions uh, for the 1042. Uh, the, you can get an automatic six-month six month extension to September 15th by filing the form 7004. For the Form 1042-S, you can get a 30-day extension by filing the Form 8809. That is only for the IRS copy. 
Um, for the recipient copy, you have to actually send a letter requesting an, a 30-day extension um, to the Martinsburg, West Virginia uh, Computing Center. The address is in the instructions to the form, but it's really important um, that, that you get that separate letter in because that's what's going to extend the recipient copy. Um, one thing that uh, is important here is the, the rules do say that you can get an additional 30 days um, upon request. The IRS has been very stingy. Um, so you get an automatic 30 days by requesting, but to get an additional 30 days, something really catastrophic had to have happened. Um, they, they've really been denying those routinely now. So why do we care about all of this? Well, we care because the IRS cares. You know, for, for years, probably a decade, they've been saying they're going to um, start actively auditing this area. And it just didn't really happen until the last probably year to 18 months. Um, before that, they, they did conduct audits of this, but it was really focused on financial institutions who were making, you know, vast, uh, you know, huge volumes of interest and dividend payments offshore. Um, now they are, actively engaged in audits of non-financial entities, looking at the accounts payable, just the routine vendor type payments. Um, they've trained over 3,000 examiners. They now have territories across the country that are all supported by this New York group in, in the financial payments practice within LBNI. Um, those are the auditors that have, have been auditing this space since 2001 when this regime was developed, um, but focused on the financial institutions. But they're there at the, as the resource to um, all of these examiners across the country now. Um, so they're really looking at this. One thing that's important to know, the, um, the, the examiners, when they're doing a normal audit of the 1120, uh, for example, they're actually required now to pen uh, their name to the manager report to say that, yes, in fact, they did look at the 1042. So we're seeing standalone 1042 audits, but we're also seeing them as an add-on to the normal tax return audit that's, that's happening. And as I mentioned here, there's, we're seeing a large uptick in the accounts payable uh, exams, and, and this is just in the last 18, 12 to 18 months. So now we're just going to go in, what exactly are we looking at in this type of payment? So I had mentioned this FEDAP income, fixed or terminable annual or periodical income. Um, it's really all income that you're paying that's U.S. source other than gain from the sale of property, market discount, or option premiums. Um, there is one exclusion to the exclusion. If you sell an IP right and the sales price is contingent on future use, that even though it was actually a sale, um, each of those payments that are made um, is going to be treated as a royalty. And so if the IP right is used in the United States, that would be a US source royalty, and that would be included. Um, so normally, your, your, your payments for goods and products and supplies are not going to be included um, in, in the types of payments you're looking at in accounts payable, but, you know, you would be looking for services and royalties, you know, when your uh, software acquisitions, you know, if it's treated as a service or a royalty, that, of course, is going to be captured and you're going to be able, you're going to need to be able to determine the source to see if you're going to be um, needing to comply with these rules. So then the source of the payment, as I said, as a withholding agent, it's your responsibility to de determine the source. The regulations provide that if you can't make a reasonable determination of the source of the payment, you have to presume that it's U.S. source. And I've got an example here where um, a U.S. company contracts with a foreign company to perform services for it. Um, it's an up front payment in this example, and the services um, at that time, we don't know where those services are going to be performed. Um, the presumption rules are going to require that you treat the entire upfront payment as a U.S. source service um, and would have to withhold accordingly. So I had mentioned earlier that, that documentation is really the key, the cornerstone to, to 1441 withholding. Your, your documentation is going to help you to determine, are you paying a U.S. person or a non-U.S. person? Um, is the person you're paying the payee or the beneficial owner? So the distinction would be if you're making a payment to a non-U.S. Uh, flow-through entity like a, a partnership or a grant or a sinful trust. They are a payee, not the beneficial owner. The underlying partners, or beneficiaries, um, or grantor would be the beneficial owner. So that, that the documentation will be the key to that. Um, it's going to let you know are, if you're making that payment to the beneficial owner, are they an individual? Are they a corporation? Um, which is going to make a big difference in certain circumstances, depending on the type of payment. And then, of course, if you can reduce the rate of withholding, either under an Internal Revenue Code section or under an income tax treaty, um, that 
those claims would be made on the WA forms. Um, and then finally, and we'll talk about this a lot as we go through this, if you don't have that documentation at the time you make the payment, there's mandatory presumption rules. And again, they were purposefully designed so that the maximum amount of withholding would be required to be imposed. All right, thank you very much, Lori. Let's go ahead and launch our next uh, polling question. So uh, asking you to share with us uh, the main types of uh, tax forms you're required to submit, uh, W-9, W-8-BEN, W-8-BEN-E, or none, as we are located outside of the U.S. Uh, just real quick, a few quick hitters um, as we have the polling question up. Could you give us a little bit more color uh, on what you mean by non-U.S. person? Someone's asking that. I hope that would be a quick hitter for you. Yeah, absolutely. So a U.S. person is going to be, if they're an individual, they're a citizen or resident of the United States. If they are a corporation or partnership, they're organized in the United States. Then a non-U.S. person by default is any person that's not a U.S. person. So an individual that is um, a, a resident outside the United States, absent, you know, a U.S. citizen would still be a U.S. person regardless of whether they live outside the U.S. and then any entities organized outside the U.S. would be non-U.S. Great. Thank you very much. Perfect. So let's go ahead and leave the polling question up for just a few seconds in order to be mindful of our time. Then we'll take a quick peek and then we'll let Lori dive back in to talk about uh, the types of NRA documentation. Let's go ahead and close the polling question. Uh, Anything stick out to you here or really, I guess, depends on the audience demographic, right? But. Yeah, yeah. So it looks like the vast the vast majority of the payments are made to U.S. persons. Um, and, you know, we've got some non-U.S. persons. And so this, this makes sense. And again, to your point, Ernie, it's going to hinge on yeah. the type of audience, what type of payments they're making. So here I'm just going to go through and briefly describe the different types of W-8 forms that there are or forms that you would get from non-U.S. persons. So first, the W-8 BEN. Um, that would be provided by a non-U.S. individual who is the beneficial owner of the income. Uh, it's it's a, the way that they are able to certify that they're not U.S. and also to claim a treaty benefit if they're entitled to one. The W-8 Ben E is the exact same thing except for an entity that's a beneficial owner. So for a non-U.S. corporation, for example, and again, they're certifying their non-U.S. status and um, able to claim a treaty benefit on that form. The W-8 ECI stands for effectively connected income. So that would be a non-U.S. person that is certifying that they're not U.S., but the income is effectively connected to a U.S. trader business. And what that means, if a non-U.S. person has a U.S. trader business, they're taxed just like you and I, as opposed to the gross basis taxation. Um, they're, they're taxed uh, at the graduated rates. They get deductions and whatnot. And this is just the form they would provide for that. A W-8 EXP, I would not expect you to see these in a normal accounts payable world. This is from um, a non-U.S. government or a non-U.S. tax-exempt entity, and they're claiming an exception under the code. A W-8 IMY, this is from a non-U.S. person that is not the beneficial owner. They're claiming they're not U.S., but they're saying the income is not mine. I'm acting on behalf of someone else as um, an intermediary or an agent, or I'm a non-U.S. partnership. I'm receiving this income on behalf of my partners. Um, all of these forms, as a withholding agent, you get the form, you validate it, and then you just keep it in your files um, for, for an audit, if, if you're audited, to support whatever withholding or reporting that you did. The oddball form here is the 8233. This is a form for an individual, a non-U.S. individual, that has performed independent personal services, so an independent contractor, and they're using this form to claim treaty benefits. This form is unique um, in that, one, it requires a U.S. TIN. Um, for a non-U.S. person that's not an individual performing services to uh, be entitled to a treaty rate, they can actually use their, their non-U.S. TIN. Um, they don't need to go get a U.S. TIN to claim that treaty benefit. But here, this is an individual that has come here to perform services in the United States. The withholding agent actually has to validate the form, send a copy to the IRS, wait five days. If you don't hear from the IRS, then you can make the payment um, at the zero rate of withholding that they've claimed on that form. So that's just one that's a little bit unique, and it's only good for one year at a time. So you would have to get one every single year. The other forms, um, with the exception of the IMY that's valid indefinitely, absent a change of circumstance, they're valid for the year signed plus the three full calendar years after that. So again, that 8233 is the oddball. So this we've all talked about. We start with the 30% uh, mandatory rate of withholding, the statutory rate. Um, if you've got documentation to support a lower rate, um, then that's 
what you would do. If you don't have the form, as I said, you would apply the presumption rules. The presumption rules are mandatory where you don't have documentation. It's going to help you determine if you're treating the, the payee as an individual or a corporation and whether you're going to have to treat them as U.S. or non-U.S. Um, and then you would withhold in report in accordance with the presumption rules. The only time you wouldn't do that is if your actual knowledge is actually going to result in a higher rate of withholding or reporting that wouldn't otherwise be there, which is very rare because, as I mentioned, these are purposely, purposefully designed to make sure that the maximum amount of withholding and reporting is imposed. So there I just wrapped up an overview of this regime, and now I'm going to go into some, some hot topics or some persistent documentation uh, issues that we just continue to see. All right, let's go ahead and uh, let me jump in here and let's do a real quick uh, level set here and get our audience to share with us how they calculate withholding so we can get a sense of the technology landscape and maybe we can add some context around that. But I'm sure Anand uh, will address that in great de 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 detail later and share with us how this world is really changing and it's really much easier and much more efficient. So maybe you use manually a spreadsheet, maybe you have a homegrown tool, maybe you have a complete AP automation tool or you just don't do that, or you might feel it's not applicable for your business. Again, everyone interested in receiving CPE credits, you'll have to answer all our polling questions here today. Of course, we appreciate everyone's consideration to answering all of our polling questions. In order to be mindful of our time, I'll go ahead and leave the polling question up for a few more seconds, and then we'll get uh, Lori's take on the results, and then we'll let Lori dive into some W9 misconceptions. So let's go ahead, give you a couple more seconds. All right, let's go ahead, and let's take a quick peak again it depends on the demographics of audience but just from what you're seeing uh with your clients uh laurie is there any big surprise here about what you expected yeah no i think this is right again uh, to your point ernie that, that it's really going to hinge on the the type of withholding agent that we're looking at and, and if the the number of cross-border payments are very small yes i would expect to see just a, a spreadsheet being used um, for, for someone that may be in the tech industry that are paying a lot of royalties, for example, to non-U.S. persons, then I would expect some type of automated tool. Um, so this kind right. of reflects it. Yeah, right. I don't think I'd kind of dovetail on this, what you mentioned, which was fantastic. But people need to understand if you're doing it manually, when you start going across borders, this can get really complicated really quickly. So let's go ahead and get back to your compelling content. And let's talk about some W-9 misconceptions. Yeah, so, so first of all, the W-9, some, some common uh, misconceptions that we see. So per the regulations, a W-9 must have a name, a tax ID, it needs to be signed, and it needs to be dated. Um, so we see a lot of problems where people are saying they're invalidating the form because the entity status wasn't completed. Well, that should not invalidate the form. However, if the field's completed, you want to review it for consistency. You want to make sure um, that it, it's consistent with the type of entity that they're claiming and also consistent with any exemption statuses that they claim. So, for example, if they claim they're an exempt recipient, which would mean not subject to 1099 reporting because they're a corporation, you want to make sure they checked corporation on the form and not partnership, for example. Um, oftentimes, people think they need to invalidate a W-9 because it doesn't have a U.S. address. That's not right. We, we don't care with U.S. persons. Again, we're taxed on our worldwide income regardless of where we live. So, we don't care about a, an address outside the United States. That's, that's not going to matter. And then this date stamping. This is an interesting issue. As I said, the Treasury regulations require the person completing the form to date the form. Um, the W-8 instructions say that if a withholding agent receives a W-8 that has not been dated, that they may date stamp it um, on the date that they receive it. We don't have that same uh, consideration for a W-9 form. It needs to be dated by the person that's completing the form. Um, on the W-8, uh, form some of the common misconceptions uh, for the country on line two we would expect it to, to generally be a non-us uh, country but there are some exceptions and that would be if the entity if the chapter three status is a trust or an international organization um, an international organization could be non-us treated as non-us but have a u.s address so that would be fine in that case and then a trust whether a trust um, they, they have some different rules regarding um, how one is treated, and it's a control and court test. Um, so a, a U.S. Uh, formation country would be acceptable for a trust. Um, the next two are whether the Chapter 3 status and the Chapter 4 status are always required, and, and they're not. The regulations say um, that you complete the form uh, 
for the transaction. So if somebody's providing a W-8 Benny, for example, um, to a bank outside the United States to certify their non-US status and there's no US source income, chapter three status is not required. And then more important for you as people that are looking at this compliance with accounts payable, the chapter four status, that's the FATCA status, um, that's not necessary because a, a routine accounts payable payment is not a withholdable payment for FATCA purposes. So a chapter four status is not required on the, the routine accounts payable um, payments. And then also whether the permanent residence address has a PO box, the instructions and the form itself actually says it shouldn't be a PO box. However, there is a notice 2001-4 that says if the withholding agent doesn't know or have reason to know that the person is US or that a street address is available, a PO box is fine. Um, I actually worked with uh, Chief Counsel's Office at the IRS when, when this notice was issued. And the reason was many people came in and said, um, for example, Saudi Arabia doesn't have physical addresses or we've got rural routes in Canada where they use PO boxes as opposed to physical addresses. So that, this concession was for those types of circumstances. So obviously if it's Paris, France, we know they have addresses and so you would expect that. But if it's um, something where you just don't know that they would have a physical address, the PO box would be fine. Uh, all U.S. addresses must be cured. That is a common misconception. Normally, yes, that's right. Um, on, on a W-8 ECI, that's again, they're, they're claiming to be, that the income is effectively connected with the trade or business. You would expect them then to have a U.S. address. And then the W-8 IMY. The due diligence rules for the tax forms and when you need to cure a U.S. address, which usually means you have to go get organizational documents or a reasonable explanation in writing as to why they have a U.S. address. It only applies to beneficial owner withholding certificates. Um, and because at W-8 IMY, they're, they're certifying I'm not the beneficial owner, uh, we don't care if that form has a U.S. address, that, that is fine. And then another misconception is that uh, affidavits cure everything. Um, unlike a W-9, if you don't have that tax ID file on file when you make that payment, um, you can't cure it after the fact. You were just supposed to impose backup withholding, and if you didn't, you're liable. On the W-8 side, the payments to non-US persons, you can actually get what's called a retroactive W-8 form um, after the fact. And that is just the IRS form with an affidavit at the bottom where they're certifying that the information on the form was true and correct back at the time they made the payments. Um, the IRS came out with, with regulations in 2014 that, that um, required additional documentation if that retroactive affidavit is obtained more than a year after the time you, that you made the payment then you would also need to get documentary evidence to support the claims that they're making. Um, and then that a W-8 ECI is always provided for effectively connected income, and that's not true. If, if the non-US person is investing in a partnership, um, the W-8 ECI is not necessary. I'm gonna uh, speed up a little bit here in the interest of time. Um, because these forms have been out for a while, but you always need to be using the latest version of the form. Um, the, the current forms were released in, in June and July of 2017. Um, they needed to, be using, needed to be used by January or February of 2018. There's some transition rules where you basically get six months um, before you need to start using the new form. Um, the one thing that is important to note is when you're looking at these dates, it's the date that you're receiving the form, the acceptance date, not the signature date. So a lot of people will fill forms out and post them up on their website and when you need it, they'll direct you over there. Um, it's the date that you received it. So if they've got an old version of the form up there, you could not accept it now. Um, so you would have to make sure that they gave you a new form um, on the most recent version. I think we've covered all of this. Oh, on the underlying forms, if you receive a W-8 IMY and the underlying forms, when you're looking at the acceptance date, so let's say you had a non-US partnership and the partners gave the forms, you would, it's the date they gave them to the partnership. So unless there's, it's obvious from the date that they couldn't have been presented within that six month period, you're fine to accept them. One, the, one last thing with these misconceptions is the withholding statement. The, withhold, the withholding statement is the uh, form that's associated with the W-8 IMY, and it's how the withholding agent is able to allocate the payment it's making to all of the underlying owners. So again, let's go back to our non-US partnership example. It's how you know to allocate the payment to each of the partners that you're getting documentation for. 
under the regulations, there's like 15 fields that are required on a withholding statement. I, in all the years I've been doing this, I've never seen a valid withholding statement. Nobody ever has all of those fields. And industry complained to the IRS saying, I'm getting all these underlying W-8 Bens and Bennies, and I have all the information I need to report on those forms. So why do I have to treat this withholding statement invalid if I got everything I need to properly withhold and report? The IRS said, okay, fine, we'll allow you to have this simplified um, withholding statement as long as there is an affidavit on that form that says that the person providing it, so the non-US partnership, um, has validated the forms and there's nothing in their files that conflict with the information. And if we go to the next slide, you can see um, there's an example here of what that would look like, that blue language at the bottom. So you can see this withholding statement's very limited, just the name of the, the underlying owner, their address, their allocation information, um, everything else you could get from the tax forms that are provided. Um, so, but you've got to have this affidavit on the bottom where they're certifying that, that there's nothing in their files that conflict, and then you could accept this, this um, alternative withholding statement. And then finally, uh, before we move into exam, we've talked about this several times now. Um, if you don't have documentation when you make the payment, or it's invalid for some reason once you went through your validation process, you must apply the presumption rules. If the payment is to an individual, um, if it, as long as it's not an offshore payment, so anyone, any U.S. withholding agent that's making a payment to an individual, the presumption is going to be that that payee is U.S., um, which would mean 24% backup withholding. Again, you would apply that unless your actual knowledge resulted in higher withholding. So if I actually knew they were non-U.S., um, then I would go with my actual knowledge because 30% withholding in, under the 1441 regime is higher than the backup withholding. For entities, it's a little bit different. You're going to be looking for indicia, whether there's U.S. indicia or foreign indicia. Um, and again, then your actual knowledge is only going to tr trump the presumption rule if it's going to result in a higher rate of withholding. So the key to all this is make sure you have the documentation because the presumption rules are extremely complicated and, and you just don't want to have to be uh, going through that process when you can just get the documentation. Now I'm just going to talk about the IRS uh, 1042 audit initiative. Um, I've got a link here that you can go. So they've updated the internal revenue manual. That's the instructions for the IRS examiners about how to conduct an audit. I can tell you from my experience, they're pretty much going by the book. So if you read through that IRM, you're going to have a great idea of, of what they're going to be looking for and the types of questions they're going to be asking you. Um, they specifically listed these industry here, these industries here as the ones that they're focused on. We are seeing this. We're seeing in particular um, the high tech industry. Um, we've seen a lot of IDRs in, in this area. Um, so that is definitely one that they're focused on. So historically, these audits had been very much forms driven. So it was really just a validation of, of your W-8s and your W-9s. We're seeing them go far beyond that. We're, they're really looking for what are your policies and procedures. We want to look at them. Um, they're looking at reconciling uh, the 1042 to the 1042S. And in particular, looking at the codes you're using. Um, historically, on exams, I never saw the IRS impose penalties um, as long as the income and the tax withheld on the 1042S uh, was correct, we just never saw penalties. But now where there's incorrect codes, incorrect exemption codes, um, wrong boxes used, we're, we're seeing them impose the penalties. And the penalties are, are now $270 per form. So $540 per payee you know, that you made the payment to that you were reporting because we've got the recipient copy and the IRS copy. So those, those penalties add up very quickly. Um, and, and we've just got some areas here to focus. And of course, for you, it, it's really the accounts payable. So you want to go through and just make sure you're, you're capturing all the correct payments so that you're withholding, and cor um, withholding correctly. Um, one thing to know, and, and don't be surprised, it, it surprised me for a long time, but to expect it, when the IRS is examining, the, the, if, if you've got a lot of payments, if your volume is really big to non-US persons, um, they're going to sample. And unfortunately, which I think is just patently unfair, but they do it, they subtract out everything from the population where you impose the 30% withholding. Um, doesn't seem right to me. It seems like a gotcha because they're only focused on, on where there might be some money and not where you did the right thing. But that is their stance, and there's been a lot of pushback, and they're still sticking with it. 
if you have a, a very small volume, expect them to look at everything. Otherwise, they're they're going to pick a sample. They're they're going to exclude the 30%, and usually they'll exclude the low dollar payments. Um, one bit of good news with all this. So I had talked a little bit ago about that you can get retroactive W-8 form. You're not going to get a lot of time in an audit, but if the IRS finds that you don't have documentation or invalid documentation, you'll usually get about 60 days to be able to go get that documentation um, to support the rate of withholding that you imposed. Previously, the IRS would calculate the underwithholding in the sample, extrapolate it across the population, and then subtract out the, the cures. So they actually were extrapolating something that you were able to cure, that, that liability across the whole population. They have changed that now. And now if you're able to get the curative documentation within that 60-day period, they'll actually then include that, you know, subtract it out of the liability before they extrapolate across the population, which can make a significant difference in the overall tax liability. So preparing for audit, what should you do? First, make sure you've got policies and procedures. Make sure you've got written policies and procedures that you can show them. Um, they're going to be interviewing your, your personnel. Make sure that you have coached your personnel and, and make sure you limit who they're going to talk to. You don't want them to just be able to be going through the organization talking to anybody they want to. Um, you want it to have that very, very much controlled. Um, proving the negative, I have here. They're, they've been spending a lot of time reviewing the businesses that they're about to examine. Um, they're reading all of the information on the websites. They're really trying to understand the, the business before they go in there. So, so just be prepared for that. They're also looking at any uh, form uh, 5471 that's filed. Um, a lot of that might be non-US source income, but that's kind of their starting point on some of the payments that you're making to related parties, and they're very focused on that. And then I had also uh, talked about this. They're very, very focused on the reconciliations. Um, so make sure that the Forms 1042S that, that you're filing match up with the income and the tax withheld on, on the 1042 that you filed, because again, this is very focused. They're very focused on this space. Um, ask for draft IDRs. Um, you want to know what they're going to ask so that you can be clear on the ask, um, because you're able, you're, you're able to negotiate some of this stuff to get clarity. And also make sure if you need additional time, you want to ask for it before they issue that IDR. Because once they issue the IDR and have a time frame in there, um, they're going to stick to it. And that's because their management is, is going to be on them for that. And so for them to go back to their management and ask for extensions causes them a lot of um, internal problems. So if, if it's a busy season for you, you know, if your business is cyclical and they actually come in when, when everybody in the tax department is just overwhelmed, make sure they know that up front because they'll work with you on that um, and they'll give you more time in the IDR, but they need to know about it before they actually issue the IDR. Um, make sure that you talk to them if they are going to sample because you've got a, a vast volume of payments. Make sure you talk to them about the sampling, that everybody's on board with what the sample is going to be. And then the key here, be prepared. You know. You can conduct annual health checks yourself. Um, you know, go pull a sample of, of payments. Go look at the documentation you have. Make sure it supports the rate of withholding, and then tie it out to the reporting. Make sure you know you use the the proper codes, um, the the proper income withholding. Make sure all of that is taken care of. Because again, as I said, it's the, the cross border payments to non US people. You can fix these things. You can amend returns, and you can go get retroactive tax documentation. So. Really important to know where you stand before you're sitting in that opening meeting talking with the examiners. And then just very briefly, I've talked about most of this, about knowing where you stand before audit. Um, but another thing, if you get to a point where you, you've gone through this exercise, you, you've done a health check, um, you've, you've obtained all the retroactive documentation that you possibly can, and you just find yourself um, with and under withholding, you know, perhaps you made payments to uh, people that were not in treaty, were not resident in treaty countries, and you didn't withhold the 30%. Consider a voluntary disclosure. The IRS is very open to these. They don't have a formal process in place or a formal program, but they do have a process in place, and they're, they're very uh, agreeable to this. And and I can tell you, I've I've never seen them impose the penalties where you're coming in voluntarily um, to to say, yeah, I, I've been reviewing my compliance, I, I see some problems, I'm, I've fixed it, but I'd like to amend my tax return and pay this tax. Um, I, I think it's something to consider um, if, if you're going through this process, as opposed to oftentimes we'll see people just have a reserve booked because they know that liability. 
you need to know one of the very first IDRs they're going to ask is, have you booked a reserve for, for under withholding liability? Um, and it's just kind of the smoking gun when you have to come back to them and say, yes, in fact, I have. Um, so important to know that there is that avenue if you find yourself in a situation where um, you just can't remediate some, some past mistakes. I think that's it. I'm going to turn it back to you, Ernie. Uh, thank you so much, Lori, for your compelling content. I know that was a lot. The good news is that we'll be recording the webinar, and we have some very in-depth questions that I don't think many of these are quick hitters, so we'll do our best to follow up with each and every one of you after the webinar. Now it's my pleasure uh, to turn the floor over to Anand Miser, who will talk about future-proofing financial operations and really how far we've come and where we're going to ensure compliance leveraging technology. And on the floor is yours, my friend. Thanks, Ernie, and uh, thanks, Lori, for the comprehensive and detailed presentation and analysis on the global payments taxes and its implications. And as Ernie mentioned uh, in the beginning, uh, my name is Anand Bistra, and I'm a director of uh, product marketing here at Tipalti. And uh, before we move to the Q&A section, I wanted to provide an overview about Tipalti's take on taxes. And this is not meant as a tax advice or anything. It's just how we manage it in the system itself. So what Tipalti does is Tipalti is working with uh, KPMG to solve the complex and highly manual process of collecting tax information through digital capture directly during the onboarding flow. So what this does is ensures that the information is validated before a payment is ever processed. So if you look at the results of the polling question number three, a majority were calculating or withholding the taxes manually, which is generally fraught with risks. So we mitigate that by requiring all the payees or suppliers to fill out tax forms or provide their VAT or local tax ID as a part of self-registration on the Tiparti portal. So what this does is helps you rest easy knowing that your payables or AP operation is always up to date uh, with the latest tax laws in many cases. And uh, we have a guided tax form uh, that a wizard actually that helps suppliers of US payers choose the correct tax form based on the country and the business structure. Once the correct tax form is selected, Tipalti digitizes the tax form documents and applies a thousand plus rules including TIN matching to ensure that proper data has been provided. And at the year end, Tipalti generates the 1099s and 1042S tax prep uh, reports and calculates any necessary withholdings. And for non-US payers, uh, local and VAT tax ID collection is available. And for European countries, Tipalti also provides uh, supports, uh, supporting documents and collections of those so that suppliers can provide additional information when needed and self-binning invoices as well, where suppliers must approve invoices before payments can be pro processed in, in many countries. So moving on to the next slide. So here's a quick view overview of the Tipalti solution. So Tipalti provides an end-to-end -end solution to manage the entire supplier payments operations, not just a piece of it. So it starts with our white label supplier management that is essentially built to make onboarding easy. And as we kind of capture all the payment data, we, we validate it with 26,000 plus rules uh, and we screen suppliers against lists such as OFAC, AML, et cetera. And the suppliers provide their tax forms or tax IDs, as I mentioned earlier, in our system, and it vets and validates to ensure legitimacy and accuracy. And, uh, you know, if you do invoice processing, we have an OCR technology that cuts the manual rekeying of invoice details uh, from the process. We also have a two and three way PO management if, if that's something that you need, and with advanced approvals and routing capabilities built into the system. And we provide cross border payments across 190 countries in 120 currencies in six different payment methods. And what you can do is centrally manage accounts payable across multiple brands, subsidiaries, or entities, and geographies, and with automatic reconciliation with several of your ERP systems uh, for quick closing of the books. And the net now piece is basically our built-in early payments automation solution. So what that does is with net now solution, you can play a, pay your suppliers earlier without adding to your workload or impacting your working capital as such. So that's a quick view of uh, our uh, Tipalti's platform. And um, we have hundreds of customers from fast growing startups to established companies across various industries that benefit, benefit from our solution. 
And we have many, many resources dedicated to get our customers up and running quickly and to assist them as they encounter new needs as they grow their business globally. And the ongoing support that our customers receive and the breadth of our offering is why we have a 98% customer satisfaction rate. And as we scale and grow with our customers as they grow globally as such. So with that, uh, I will hand it back to Ernie for the Q&A section. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Anand, and thank you very much so much for giving us an overview and the technology piece of this. Um, is absolutely mind-blowing to me, and so I'm sure we've got a lot of questions that we'll get into here, and we'll save some uh, for after the webinar as well. And so I just want to remind everyone we can still take your questions in the questions area if you go to webinar control pile, uh, panel. Again, we'll, we are going to do our best to get uh, to your questions. If not, we'll follow up with you directly. Uh, real quick question, oh, Lori, I don't know if this is a general thing you can answer, but um, just some a lot some questions around um, when a wet signature is required as opposed to a digital signature, particularly in a W-8 versus a W-9 form. Is there any general guidance you could give us there? Yeah, so so any electronic signature is fine as long as it meets the eSign Act. Um, if a One thing that's important, there was some a regulation change that just recently happened um, that said if you're providing the electronic if you have an electronic system and you're providing the forms to another person, so let's say, again, going back to my example of the non-US partnership, let's say that non-US partnership has an electronic W-8 system and they're getting you know, W-8s with electronic signatures, the, the signature line needs to indicate just by looking at it that, that it was an electronic signature, so you know, electronically signed by or something like that, as opposed to just the type signature. Um, because because you're providing those forms to somebody else who doesn't have any relationship with that that system, and if it doesn't, then you're going to have to give a certification that your system meets the requirements of the IRS. But as far as meeting the the e sign Act, what the IRS wants is to make sure that when the signature is being provided, that the person understands that they're they're signing this tax form. So oftentimes we see something like by typing my name and hitting submit, I acknowledge I'm signing this tax form under penalties of perjury. What the IRS is looking for is is they don't want the person signing the form to ever be able to, to have an argument to say, when I did that, I had no idea I was signing this tax form. Um, and so that that's usually what the, the types of things we see to, to meet the requirements of the eSign Act. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, Lori, let me go ahead and ask the next question uh, to Anand, and this kind of hits in my wheelhouse as a treasury professional in my past life. And so um, in my experience, tax compliance and payments processes were managed in complete silos. So from your solution, it looks like there might be tremendous benefits to um, having those aligned. So how are you getting companies to look at this as an overall process and make this streamline so that the tax compliance is part of that payments process? What role is technology playing here? Anand, are you there with us? Can you hear me, Ernie? Uh, yeah, I can hear you. All right, um, let me get, get back in there. I think I had a little technical issue there. So, Anand, uh, can you share with us um, how, how you're motivating companies uh, to really look at this entire process of payments and tax compliance in the same vein instead of looking at these in silos and the role that technology can play there? Yeah, I mean, can you hear me, Ernie, now? Yeah, I can hear I was you. Uh, responding to the previous question. No, sorry about that. That's okay. So I was actually not on mute. There is a technology problem. So to your previous question, what we do is, like I mentioned earlier, we kind of like it's a part of our onboarding process. So we try to collect all the forms, the W-9s and w 8 and all the forms that are there and as prescribed by uh, KPMG at upfront so that, you know, our suppliers and payers are basically in compliance when it comes to that. And then I mentioned earlier, we do all the withholdings with 1099s and at 1042S and provide the withholdings at the end of the year. So we ensure that, you know, we don't provide again tax advice, but we ensure that they are compliant with the system as it relates to uh, the payments that go out to the system itself. And from that perspective, not only do we kind of provide that information, but we also collect the documentation at our end. So it is available for review and analysis towards the end as well. 
Okay, great. Just a quick follow-up. Uh, how do you ensure that the information that you showed on the tax side is up to date? I assume you said you work with KPMG, but um, how how is how is that data getting pushed in there? And can you just touch on that just a little bit? Yeah, so we have actually a team that uh, that separately works on this, keeping it updated on a regular basis. So they are kind of tasked with uh, monitoring all the changes that happen with the IRS, et cetera. And on an occasion, I think, uh, works with KPMG to validate what we are doing is the right way of doing it. So it's a team that is dedicated to, you know, updating it. And because we are a software company primarily, and we are able to update this uh, quickly and pass it on to our basically customers to do that. Uh, great. And that's just one thing that I, I'm really excited about the technology is that a lot of this technology is being built to serve the accounting and treasury and finance profession. So it's really exciting for me as a former practitioner. Uh, Lori, let me go ahead and uh, direct the next question to you. Um, someone's asking if they can process a payment to non-U.S. persons with no withholding certificate as long as they withhold 30%. Yes, that's right. If you don't have tax documentation and you're making a payment of U.S. source of adapt income to a non-U.S. person and you impose the 30% withholding, then you have satisfied your responsibilities as a withholding agent. Yes. Okay, thank you so much. Let me – all right. Um, someone's asking, Lori, go ahead and uh, put this your way. If you have a W-8 documentation on file for all the foreign vendors, does it mean a 1042 is not needed? And if not, when when would you give them advice to use the Form 1042? Yeah, so if you've got the W-8 forms um, for your payments to your non-U.S. vendors and you're making payments of U.S. source FDAP income, so let's say they're coming to the U.S. and performing services for you and you're making those payments, um, you would have the, ten, the, the W-8 to see if you could reduce the rate of withholding under a treaty. You would always have reporting. So let's say it's exempt under the treaty. That doesn't exempt you from reporting. There is always reporting if you make a U.S. source for that payment to a non-U.S. person. So you would be reporting on the 1042S, the information return, a copy goes to the IRS and a copy goes to, to your non-U.S. vendor. And then the 1042 is actually the tax return. So you would always file that even if there's no tax liability because the tax documentation supported a zero rate of withholding. You would still just show that there's no tax liability. You'd show the gross income, um, but there would always be the 1042, the tax return, and the 1042S reporting. Great. Thank you so much. And I'll go ahead and direct the next question your way. Uh, are you seeing um, any industries in particular where there is more of a technology adoption and specifically the adoption of the approach to look at that? payables process from end to end, including the tax and the risk compliance, where are you seeing uh, traction and where do you think there's really low hanging fruit for people where they can really uh, take control of risks that they don't know are there and really save themselves a lot of heart, uh, headaches? Sorry, I wasn't mute there. Uh, so we are seeing, I mean, if you look at industry, I mean, the party is basically industry agnostic. So we serve uh, cross-functional industries. But if you see adoption-wise, I think it's more on the software and IT side that we see a lot more adoption and awareness of uh, what needs to be done and automation from the tax perspective. But from the perspective of low-hanging fruit, I think you know most of the customers that we have use this particular capability as it's built in. And we get you know, testimonials from customers, not only from the benefits that we provide in terms of payments and automation, uh, but from uh, you know, uh, protecting them from risk, basically. Right. Not just tax, but fraud and other kinds of risk that are built into the system. So the OFAC checks, the AML compliance, et cetera, that is built in. So that's the service that we provide, and you know, customers love it and welcome it, basically. Uh, thank you so much. Lori, let me ask you a few more questions, then we'll uh, wrap things up for the Q&A session. Uh, Lori, um, another question for you. If if someone's paying products to a company in a non-treaty country, um, do they need to withhold and how much? Yeah, so if it's, it's a purchase of good, so... Um you know, hardware or supplies, that, that would be excluded from the definition of, of FEDAP income. Um, so there would be no withholding, no reporting required, and no tax documentation required. That said, I still think it's best practice when you're onboarding a vendor, um, because you never know when there's going to be associated services. Um, so let's say you buy hardware. Um, 
it may be a lump sum. And this is actually something that the IRS is very focused on on audit. They look for the, the large hardware acquisitions and, and oftentimes it's just a lump sum, but built in with that hardware purchase is installation, training, maintenance. Those are all services. And if they're being performed inside the US, um, the IRS is gonna expect you to bifurcate that, to, to figure out a reasonable allocation um, for the services versus the goods. Um, but as long as it's just goods, no withholding, no reporting. Um, but if there's any associated services, you want to make sure that, that you're capturing that. Okay, great. Um, last question for our Q&A session. I'm going to go ahead and launch our final polling question. I would like to get uh, input um, from both of our speakers here today, a little bit different take. So, Lori, um, if you could give us, I know this is <laughs> might not be the easiest question, but a key takeaway Three things companies can do to the best way to stay on top of tax regulations to make sure they stay compliant and that they can sleep better at night. Yeah, sure. So um, I do think that that as I said, there, there's actually a Pub 515 that the IRS issues, and and it's one of the best publications I think that they actually issue. They keep it up to date every single year, and it talks in detail about cross-border payments, what's subject to withholding, what's subject to reporting, great resource. Um, but I think, again, as long as you're getting tax documentation up front as a best practice, and again, knowing that the IRS is very focused on auditing um, this particular area of, of tax compliance right now, and to do that due diligence yourself. You know, you don't have to engage a third party. Have somebody in your tax or, uh in your tax department, actually act as if they're the IRS. Pick a sample of, of payments. Go look at your tax documentation. Make sure it supports uh, the withholding and, and all the way through to the reporting. Because again, on the cross-border payments, all of that can be fixed up front. And I had mentioned you know, that you can fix it during the exam. 60 days is not very much time. Um, oftentimes you don't have a business relationship with that person anymore. You can't find them. You can't find the right person to sign a form. So, so do this before you're actually sitting with the IRS um, because there's a lot you can clean up on your own. Okay, great. Thank you so much. Uh, now I'll go ahead and um, uh, pose the final question to you. So can you share with us uh, a few key components um, of the business case for investing in technology to mitigate this risk, but but also a few of the benefits to looking at this as an entire process and the and the advantage of uh, leveraging technology to take control of that payments process for us. Yeah, yeah, sure. So I think one of the things that we are seeing is that you know accounts payable is a function which can easily be automated, at least uh, eighty percent of it, and it doesn't need to be manual. And you know, people kind of get more time back, more resources back, finance people especially to do more strategic tasks. And when there is technology available to automate it, I don't see any reason why you know folks need to do it the manual, or, you know, the old-fashioned way in many cases. And if there is any advice that you know we give to people to do it, is to basically from the tax compliance, risk, fraud, etc., be proactive, be prepared, and don't leave it till the last minute. And basically, the you know, Laurie mentioned uh, you know earlier why care because the IRS cares in terms of taxes, and we want to provide a service to our customers to ensure that all the forms and compliance and everything is collected up front and validated even before the payments are made. So automate, 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 and then you can focus on strategic tasks, and that's how modern companies work. Oh, I think that's fantastic, and I'm just a dovetail a little bit, and so. When you really start to look at accounts payable, you look at the tremendous cost savings and processing cost. Again, you're impacting productivity, which Anand mentioned very, very well, well said. And then also um, on that side of it is just that you're you're controlling these risks and you really can't put too much of a price tag, but you've got to quantify that at some point. And so uh, keeping yourself out of the paper in those penalties can be extremely large. And so with that, I'd like to close the Q&A session again. We'll get to folks uh, after the webinar is over to get to those longer, complicated questions. Uh, first of all, I want to thank um, Lori Hatton Boyd from your, for your tremendous content. We know you're very busy and she's in high demand across the world. So, Lori, thank you so much. Uh, I'd also like to thank pleasure. I'd also like to thank Anand for his fantastic uh, content and insights as well. I strongly encourage everyone to take a look at the Topalti website. They have some fantastic thought leadership resources across all areas of accounts payable and uh, tax compliance. And finally, to you, the audience, thank you so much for your valuable time. We sincerely appreciate the support of each and every one of you. Make the rest of your day great, everyone. Thank you so much.
Thanks.